today on Racing Legends Podcast, I have retired jockey Declan Carroll, who a tremendous bug rider and a, a journeyman the last several years in the uh, in the Midwest, uh, decided to hang his boots up and I guess become an agent and other exciting things I'm sure he'll, he'll tell us about. Uh, Declan, uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Well, I appreciate you having me on to speak and uh, hopefully it'll be a good one. Oh, I'm sure it will be, man. Well, look, I I know as a jockey, um, you know your 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 whole personality, your whole um, identity has probably been tied up in being a jockey. Um, I'm I'm a big guy. I've never been a jockey before, but I remember when I when I quit playing basketball, and um, I've always referred to myself as a basketball player, and not, then I wasn't anymore. Uh, you know, is that, is that something that's is going to be challenging for you? You know, the fact that you know you're, you're I, I introduced you as a retired jockey that that's 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 those are kind of those days are kind of behind you. You think it's going to be a challenge for you? Um, you know, at first it's you know like anything, it's um, always tough to go from um, what you maybe considered uh, that'll be your main job until you can um, just stop and ride off into the sunset, so to speak. Um, but for myself, uh, it, I think from it'll be much easier because I'm still getting to do what I love in a way um, to get offered the opportunity I did for uh, Sheree DeVoe and David and Gordo. Um, it was it, it made my decision uh, very easy, and um, obviously, in any transition, it's going to be difficult. Um, but for the opportunity I got, it's going to make it made the decision much easier than um, if it was for somebody else. Yeah. Like she, she, Gordo was the guy that was in, picked out flight line, I believe. So tell us what your new opportunity is. Along David and Gordo and his team, people that he works with, but um, a lot, there's a few kids my age that work along with David. And um, I've always been interested in the blood stock side of things. Hopefully one day I'll be able to go full time with the joining his team. And then as well with, I'll be with Sheree DeVoe um, in the mornings, as well as working to get my assistant trainer's license um, and work with her team. Uh, so when I was given that opportunity to do kind of both things in one, uh, that made it very easy. So, so, so Declan, um, I, I know you're not going to be riding races anymore, but do you still, are you still be getting on horses in, in your task as a, a, a working with trainers and also as a bloodstock agent? Yes, um, I'll be with Sheree DeVoe, uh, so I'll be mainly based in Lexington at Keeneland um, until the summertime, and she will she has around three barns full of horses up there, so she'll definitely be having me very busy, um, you know, with as many horses as she has and only growing um, with her team, uh, that, that won't be a problem. I'll probably be getting on around six to ten horses a morning. Um, so that's something I'll, I'll do for until I can anymore. Um, getting horses is the first love of mine. So that's what we do it for. Yeah. Well, I want to, I want to, I want to get back to your riding, but I was curious, you're the son of David Carroll, the trainer. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, that is. That's my he, father. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was a tremendous guy to bet, especially on the turf. And I know he, he works for Mark Cassie now. Is that, is that right? Dick, Declan? Uh, well, he actually uh, a couple of days ago he just started with Sheree DeVoe as well, and okay. um, so he's joined uh, her team, and uh, so he'll be uh, having what managing uh, with uh, a few of the other her assistants um, there at Keeneland. Yeah. So what is going on in the industry in that you got trainers like your father, um, and there's a lot of good trainers now, and it seems like the all the horses are going to like just a, a smaller number of, of people and then other really good horsemen are working for them. What, 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 what's going on in the, in the industry that you, at least that you can see that that's causing that to happen? Uh, well, I think it comes down to, you know, you have from, you know, nowadays anything with sports uh, to racing, if the statistics, um, if you're not at a high percentage early on, you'll see many young trainers come into this business and they need somebody to support them that allows them to take a horse that may be competing in an allowance per se, um, and then put it in straight for 30 just to get a win off the bat. Um, you know, new owners come in, it's like anything. Uh, you want to be on a losing team or a winning team? Well, they're going to go probably for the trainer with the higher percentage and, you know, not everybody has the opportunity to do that, to have horses to just drop and put them in because 
the few horses they have or their livelihood. Um, you know, it's like anything. I know, I know there's, uh, people that want to cap on horses in racing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I think you talked about that with a previous trainer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I can't necessarily agree with that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, that would be kind of take, you know, that's kind of saying, well, just because he has 200 horses, 300 horses, uh, we're capping that. Um, well, he has that many horses for a reason. Um, it's just like in any business, there's businessmen who make it to the top for certain reasons. Um, obviously everybody needs a little help along the way. Um, but they're at the top for a reason. And those few trainers have those horses, uh, for the, what they've done since the beginning. Um, they, they obviously have, a the horses to do what they kind of want with and, um, owners don't control them. Um, and many smaller trainers, you have to listen to the owner. Um, whereas you may see a horse fit somewhere else, but the owner, uh, well, he's paying the bills. So you listen to what he says in a sense. Um, but you know, it's hard for me to, you know, I'm not a trainer. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not an owner. So I, I don't necessarily have a, probably a broad, broad, broad aspect of, um, why that happens. Um, but I, I would say, you know, with the, like anything you can't, can't stop from somebody being what they're good at and taking and saying you can't have a certain amount of horses. Um, I don't see a cap coming into this industry and I, um, I don't think it should. Yeah. I remember when I was out in California last, I talked to Sean McCarthy and at the time he was working for yeah. Mike McCarthy. Um, yep. And so this, this happens a lot. Um, do you, does, does your father enjoy that? The fact that he's an employee, he's a great horseman. He can just kind of focus on his work and, you know, some of the other things that an entrepreneur has to do, you know, the, the payroll and the other, the other stuff. Um, you know, he doesn't have the ultimate responsibility in that. Does, does he, does he enjoy that? You know, I obviously like, uh, like anyone, um, you know, having your name on the paper is always nice seeing under your name for <laughs> winning. And, you know, he has, he had lots of success as a trainer um obviously at the at the end it got tougher with fewer owners fewer horses and he didn't have the stock uh you know i'm obviously a little biased that's my dad but <laughs> he didn't have the stock he deserved yeah he was given a very good opportunity by mr cassie and to um manage a good amount of horses some very nice horses along the way and when that came in play you know it's you take the stress off your the shoulders of uh, paying the feed man, the farrier, and all that has to come into play. Um, and then along with now, he has joined Cherie's team. Uh, Cherie, you know, that her team is, there's no ego in it. There, She has a great group of people that work with her. Um, everybody for her wants the best for the horse. They want the horse, they, all their horses go to the paddock with a chance to win. Um, they're, pre they're prepared phenomenally. And when you join a team like that, it definitely makes it much easier. And the transition will be much easier compared to going somewhere you might not want to. Um, so when you're working along those type of people that want uh, you to succeed and for everyone else to succeed, it makes it a, a much easier transition. Yeah. And I, I'm similar to your father. I, I own my, my own businesses. I've been president of a company and now I work with someone else and I sell. And I, I appreciate that opportunity. I mean, obviously, you know, we all we all have ambitions, yeah. but but sometimes it's good just to have a really good job. And I guess you're doing the same thing. You went from a jockey to an employee as well. Well, well, Declan, I, I, I'm sure it's that they interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no. OK. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure it, it. this is probably the easiest question you, you're ever asked. But how, how did you get into riding? I'm, I'm sure hanging around your, your father's barn. Um, yeah, actually. Um, so growing up, um, my sister, she rides, uh, horses. She was, uh, always into the eventing world and, um, we always had horses of our own. So, um, being, uh, you know, around my sister and show horses, you don't just jump into race horses. Um, so, you know, I was lucky to grow up in a family with, you know, we always had horses. Um, so my mom would always take me out to ride horses uh, show horses um, after school and I had my pony and then I've fallen into an x-ray horse uh, that my father trained named Dr. Rapp um, and so when I was given that kind of this is a uh, I always had the option to play sports which I did uh, but it always came to um, when can I go around my horses it wasn't a 
you know, it wasn't something that I was forced into ever. I was always given the opportunity to do something else. Um, but when I was always around the horses, it's what I love to do. And um, so I was very, it was much easier for myself growing up in a family of horses as for somebody else coming from the outside and wanting to get into horses, uh, which can be a, a bit more difficult and um, expensive as well, like any sport. Yeah. Are, are you natural lightweight? Did you have, did you have struggles with weight as a rider? Um, you know, early on in my career, I was, I was very lucky. I had, I, you know, I was around starting, uh, around a hundred pounds. So I was very, but I had no muscle. I was very coming out of high school. I could eat whatever I want. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was always active. So that always made it easier. Uh, but as I, you know, as my second, third, fourth and now fifth year, I, it, weight was getting much harder. I was, you know, averaging losing four to six pounds a day. Uh, to ride um you know it's when as before you ride the more muscle you put on um for myself i love being in the gym and you know it's when you put on that muscle muscle weighs more than fat and um i've like now i can tell you um the day i rode i went from you know 116 to now i'm 135 um, <laughs> that was you know, quick it was very, very <laughs> <laughs> yeah very very easy, you know, but, and that's just eating and um, drinking normally. That's not anything that's excessive. So my body was, uh, it was ready to not be so malnourished and um, live a little more. Uh, and that aspect, uh, my opportunity came at the right time because um, it was getting very difficult for myself. I'm sure a lot of riders are in this situation. Do 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 they have it as tough as you though, losing four to six a day, or are most in that same boat, or most of them have a little bit easier than that? Uh, obviously, you know, I know guys are in there losing. They're averaging five to seven. Um, some have to lose two to three. Um, it's it's very it's very select few that don't have to lose any weight and have no problems with it. Um, it's, you know, you're asking a grown man to do, or a grown woman to have to attack 118 is usually uh, our maiden's weight. And when you have to attack that little weight, you're usually 115, 116. And so when you have grown adults trying to do that weight, uh, most of us have to do a lot of excessive sweating and physical activity to get to that weight. So, um, and then obviously, you know, there's always, we're all, diuretics and things like that so uh everyone rides the sacrifice a lot to do what they do and um it's very hard to compete after doing that every day i don't see how that could be enjoyable i mean even with the rush of riding horses which i know has to be great and winning races which is amazing i can't imagine it could be enjoyable having to lose that weight even if you're even if you're doing well yeah um but it's it's at the end of the day when you're you know especially if you're, when you're winning races if you're doing well losing the weight makes it easier if you don't mind it yeah um, it's it's like when you're working out and you're being and you're successful you go in with a bit of a confidence boost you know it makes it, when you're doing well it's not it's not too bad you you, you know you're able to sacrifice it but it's you know like a lot of guys are out there struggling um, it definitely makes it much tougher on your um mental game like physically um but it's you know it going in you know it's part of it's part of when you sign up for so to say you know you know it's part of the business it's um so there's no uh going into it saying oh, i won't have to do that um you should do well you're gonna have to make those sacrifices I'm not willing to make those sacrifices it's not the job for you yeah well, I think one thing you had, I would imagine, was a challenge is uh, a lot of your career, or some of your career was during the COVID time and tracks were having to, to balance, um, you know, restrictions. And it was, it was a tough time for the racing industry generally. Did, how, how, did, how did COVID affect your, your career? Um, you know, for, COVID for me, like we had a couple of months off um, and during those couple of months off, I was able to uh, go to Mr. Cassie's farm in Ocala and get on a bunch of horses um, every morning. Uh, but I was able to stay very fit during the COVID period. And then when we were racing during the COVID period, when you just had to wear masks, 
Um, I was very successful during that time. So I was getting a lot of my courses in the afternoons, and um, so I mean, my it made uh, my job a bit easier during that time. Um, mentally, I was good. Physically, I was fit. Um, so I was staying busy during COVID. I was never restricted. I was never just sitting in the house. Um, so I was lucky for the opportunities around me that ar arose. And um, no, I, COVID for me was much easier than for many other people. No, that's great. How are young riders treated this, these days? I, I know that some of these jocks rooms, you got you know more than a hundred or so riders in there, and here comes a bug. He's getting seven pounds and five five pounds. Are the are the are the journeymen help? Are they helpful or is are they competitive or tough on kids? What's what's the uh, what's the mood like for young riders with the older older guys? And for all the rooms I've been into, the atmosphere and you know it's always been very good and uh, welcoming. Um, but you know, obviously, if you're an apprentice coming in and you think you're the man or you have a good week or two weeks and you start getting an ego on, they'll let you know and tell you, you know, they're only looking out for you um, in that way because when you start getting an ego and you start um, thinking you're a little, you're a little above everyone else, um, you'll get humbled very quick uh, in this business. Um, you know, it's, you never see jockeys at the top side as you can, I ride Ortiz or Johnny Velasquez guys that have made it through the thick and thin and they're at the top of their game every day um you don't ever see them with egos you don't you know they're very humble um so if you're in a bug and you're thinking so to say you're the man uh, well you've got a lot to learn because uh the humbleness will come very quick <laughs> yeah life, life has a way of humbling you generally uh what, what are some of the riders that you that you really respect um the way they ride their artistry their performance what, name some of the riders that you've that you you like to watch ride and learn from. Um, so when I was you know a rider like that, Adam Bethitza, uh, oh, he, yeah. he's I consider him a brother of mine. He's um, you know I've lived with him, with my father uh, when he came over. Um, so he's always had very good interest for myself. Um, he's always had my back um, through everything. Um, so just to watch him ride and the opportunities he, he was able to get um, at Turfway this winter uh, were thoroughly deserving. Um, it's like anything, you need those opportunities uh, to kind of show your true skills. And um, Adam's done that through the years he's been in the U.S. Um, so uh, he's definitely, as a friend, but as a mentor, uh, he's um, an excellent jockey and uh, hopefully he'll have a big Keeneland coming up. Um, you know, Ray Lou Gutierrez, Ray Lou's been a great friend of mine, um, as well as I've been able, to, from being his roommate um, in his house in Kentucky to um, when I was in 2019 going up to New York for my first winter. Uh, he's the first jockey to come uh, welcome me and um, help me with anything I needed there. And we've been uh, great friends ever since. Um, so, you know, those two guys would be my main, um, you know, from helping me through everything being uh, great friends of mine. Um, so those are, you know, you know, I'm not uh, somebody to try to, you know, you fall, you want to learn off guys. You want to, you know, obviously take tips and tricks for everyone, but at the end of the day, you have to be your own rider and kind of take tools from those guys and put them in your own arsenal. Um, you never want to try to be exactly like someone else because when you do that, you're not yourself and it's only going to hurt you more than help you. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about the circuit you, you rode on is the tracks are so different. Uh, and since they're configured so different, the timing when you make a move has to be different. Like fairgrounds, you have the very long stretch. Turfway, you had the you had the artificial. Churchill kind of had the sweeping turns. Keeneland, uh, it's a little more balanced, but it's, but they're all very, very different. Was was that a challenge as a rider learning how to, how to when to make a move on different tracks? Um, so I like obviously for myself the turf. Um, to say at Woodbine, uh, when I was you know okay. spending two seasons up there, yeah. you have a very long stretch and you have to be very patient. Um, but I was able for the turf. I'm, I was able to adapt at any track I was at. Um, I just have a, I had a you know it, was, it became very easy to me to ride the turf. Um, as say maybe the dirt, as it took me a bit more time to kind of gain that confidence. And when to make moves, um, if you're running a fast type of track, 
a deep track. Um, those come into play. And then to the synthetic, the synthetic, um, you know, it's, it can be a it can come very heavy as compared to when it's hot, it gets extremely fast, um, mm -hmm. just like at Arlington, uh, to Woodbine, and then Turfway. Those are all, you know, Tapita synthetic tracks, um, but they all ride very differently. So, um, you know, you just, it's kind of, you got to study the playbook per se and on the day. And once you ride over it once or twice, you should have a good gist over it. Um, but, you know, for the for me, the most difficult thing was riding the dirt um, mm -hmm. as compared to the synthetic and turf, which can be pretty easy to me. Yeah, it makes me sad uh, when you bring up Arlington. Uh, yeah. So, so Declan, I, I got in touch with you pretty easily on social media. <laughs> um, is, is that a problem that jockeys have, though? Like, when, when do, do fans bother you a lot? Uh, is, the you know, the old days... When we used to go to the racetrack when I was a kid, sometimes we go out to the we go out to the fence and we would talk to the jockeys. Always, always, most likely good natured, but we always would have a banner with jockeys. But basically, you know, you couldn't really find them anywhere. They had their own little own little world. Uh, but nowadays, with social media, you know, jockeys are on Twitter, they're on Facebook. Uh, is, is is do you have relationships with fans? Is, do jockeys and fans communicate a lot? And can that be? Uh, what, what are some of the good and bad uh, parts of that? Well, you know, starting off, okay, say the bad parts of social media, um, you know, a lot of jockeys, you know, they, they hesitate, uh, you know, wanting to look at their social media because you'll have messages and including myself and many other jockeys have this experience after a day of racing, they may have a bad day in the office and you get messages of people on social media telling you, I hope you break your neck, hope Jeez. you break your back, hope your career's ending, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, wishing bad on the families. Families have nothing to do with it. Um, you know, it, it's – and I know it happens in every sport. You see it on Twitter after a football game, say, and the QB throws a bad pass. The next thing you know, he's getting demolished on Twitter, Instagram. Um, so, you know, that's a put-off for many of the jockeys and many – anybody in sports. Uh, but that comes, with the, that comes with being on social media, just like if you're on YouTube get comps you're gonna get some guy that you've never seen doesn't even have a profile picture um and you know it's just negativity um but i also think it's important if what we do for a living and anybody in, in kind of any industry uh if you're on social media it's it's great exposure for yourself your business and to interact with fans and have that transparency i think they appreciate it um it's good for yourself and um, I've always been pro, you know, I'm always on social media, maybe a little too much. Um, but I think it's a great way to interact with the fans, the gamblers. Um, you may get a question from somebody after you make a ride, uh, maybe a choice in a race, and they don't quite agree with it. Um, as long as they're respectful, um, I'll give them an answer and I'll give them my feedback. Um, I think they deserve that. They put in uh, their own money into the game. They you know, they watch it on TV or go to the races every day. Um, so that, and that only engage when you're engaging with the fans, the gamblers, uh, the owners, trainers, um, it, it only can, I think, be a positive if you put positivity into it. Um, you can turn a negative into a positive, just like you can turn a positive into a negative. Um, so I think transparency is a big thing. Um, and hopefully more jockeys uh, can be, do that um, as long as it comes with, you know, respectful and no positive. It's it reminds me of a story. So I'm Facebook friends with Adam Moore, Adam Moore Santos, I believe his name is. He's a rider in Delaware one time. Oh, yeah, Adam Moore. Yeah, yeah, he's a very, very good rider. So uh, <laughs> after a race in Delaware one time, I was, it was, it was the only speed in the race. And, you know, he's a very good rider. So he took, he takes him back and, uh, he doesn't do any good. And I, and I messaged him. I said, look, I, I'm not critical, but I'm just dying to know, uh, why did you, why did you take that horse back? And I could tell he was so frustrated because he, he let out a couple sentences on me. But then he <laughs> said, basically the, the owner told him to, and he, you yeah. know, he's like, and he knew it. So, uh, the next time the same horse ran, uh, he was, he was in a race and he was again, one of the only speed horses in the race. He went to the lead, but Everyone else did. And he went a million miles yeah. an hour and he got last. And I told myself, well, Julian, that's what you get for 
for messaging the guy. He, he was really nice about it. And I could tell he was more exasperated than I was, but he's just, look, I, I have to follow orders. Like she, the, the yeah. horse was supposed to come back and I took, I took the horse back. Um, but uh, no, it's, that's, it's true that, you know, you have owners and trainers, they may tell you how to ride a race. And sometimes it's the owner telling the trainer to tell you, and the trainer has to take the bullet for it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not, may, they may not agree with it, but when you're asked to do a certain job, um, you, you know, you do it. They even, you know, a lot of guys, sometimes, you know, if you're a, if you're a Johnny V and I ride per se, Jose Ortiz, you know, one of the bigger guys, you, you know, a lot of trainers and others, they, they say, you know, do your job. You're the best for a reason. We want, but say if you're a smaller guy or someone, say when I was riding or, you know, a lot of trainers or the owner, they're going to give you what they want done and you have to follow those orders um, because you may not have the business to just lose them out if the horse doesn't win and you go against their orders. Um, so, you know, there's a risk and a reward to come with it. Um, but, you know, if you're, you have to let, for the most part, you're listening to what the owner and trainer have to say. Yeah. I'm good buddies with Forrest Boyce. And she rode a, she rode a horse for me up at Penn National one day. So I, I, I live in the D.C. area, so I drove up there to Penn National. And Penn National had implemented a new thing where they wouldn't let you in the paddock unless you had a, had a badge. And I didn't have a badge, right? So I drove all the way up there, and they wouldn't let me, let me go in the paddock. So Forrest is walking the horse out. And I just looked at her because I couldn't go in the paddock. I, so I really, really could communicate. And I just said, what do you think? She goes, well, we should be, we should be, up, we should be up near the lead. <laughs> so Forrest goes a million miles an hour. We end up losing that day. Still love her. She's still my friend. And she, <laughs> when, she, when she came home, everyone asked her, Forrest, why'd you go so fast? She blamed me. I'm like, Forrest, <laughs> I couldn't even go in the paddock. I come home and you blame me for it. And so it was, it was she, she she denies the story to this day but if she's listening out there for uh, uh you knew you know that happened uh, i don't know do you, do you know Forrest? i uh i don't know her personally but as a rider i do um uh from watching her and uh, she's a, she's very good and very talented and she she does quite well so uh she's she definitely knows what she's doing yeah she's good she's amazing but you know yeah. for she got me she got me everyone's blaming me <laughs> <laughs> I was here. someone has uh, to take the blame yeah I think someone has to take the blame this time it was the owner uh, um, the rider Declan Cannon how did that affect you yeah. that your guys' name was so close so I, I would sometimes handicap a rate and I I, uh, I do my own uh, jockey ratings uh, and you you both happen to be very good turf riders so I um, it didn't really matter to me which what you of you were, were, were on a horse generally because I, I usually only bet turf routes and and then both you guys scored quite well for me, but it was interesting. And I always wonder. I bet you that was that could have a a, a strange effect on you guys. If sometimes people are they're, they're getting you on the horse and they, they think they're getting him, or or, or vice versa. <laughs> yeah, Declan Cannon's a very good friend of mine. Oh yeah, uh, okay. we make jokes about it all. <laughs> we make jokes about it all the time. Um, he, uh, I think, the day I um, announced that I wasn't, I was uh, stopping my riding career. He said the next evening at Turfway, about five people came up to him and uh, said, congratulations uh, on your retirement. We wish you the best. <laughs> he goes, it's not me. Wrong guy. He said, I'm, <laughs> I'm continuing to ride. Um, but no, De Declan's a great friend of mine. And uh, at first, you know, people, yes, yeah, you'll have some people say, uh, they'll confuse you with you riding a horse or, um, you know, it's, uh, but look, it's, uh, if you look at the fine print and the name, it takes only a couple seconds to realize I'm Carol. He's Cannon. We're in different places, um, but we, uh, me and Declan, always joke about it. It's uh, for us. It's just uh, it's a bit of comedy. <laughs> yeah. Who was the hardest? Who was the hardest conversation you had to had with about retiring? Um, is there anyone that you 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 is that the? Uh, I mean, it's it's your life, and yeah. we all know it's not, the, yeah. it's not it's not the safest job in the world. Uh, but was there anyone you had a difficult time telling that you're you were giving it up? Um, you know, I, I, you know, obviously, uh, I think I first discussed it, um, with my dad, uh, my dad's my biggest influence, you know, he's been my biggest influence and he's been my kind of personal idol since, um, you know, I was young. Uh, he's, he took me to the races since I was, whenever I wanted, when I was younger, I was by his probably once, uh, five years old, I was by his hip going to all the races with him. So, um, you know, he's been my biggest supporter since I started. 
Um, many opportunities I was given was because of him. Um, it wasn't because what I did or uh, what other people did. It was because of him. Uh, whether he'll he'll say he did that for me or not, um, I know he did. Uh, he's a you know. So look, he he was the first person I told when I was. It was in my mind. Um, I was from uh, Sheree and David. They they uh, you know they talked to me about it uh, about a year ago. They offered me um, to kind of be on their teams. Uh, so it was it was in question uh, last year, and um, it was always in my mind. But I wasn't ready for it. I wanted one more season at Woodbine. Um, so and then after I completed that season at Woodbine, um, it it was kind of something I talked more serious with my dad about. And you know, obviously, my dad, you know, it was very it was hard to discuss with him because he's done a lot for me uh, as a rider and anything else I wanted in the horse racing industry or the urban industry, I should say. Um, so, you know, but he made it easy and he, he was, he made us, you know, do what you want to do. That's at the end of the day, no one can make that kind of decision for you. Um, so when I felt like it was time, um, you know, it was able to roll off my shoulders pretty easy and I knew the opportunity I was going with, I felt comfortable with, um, you know, and Shereen David as well. They, they didn't push it on me. They, it was only if I, you know, brought it up. They never, they asked me once. And they said, next time, you you know, want to talk about it, you let us know. And um, they gave me that time and, uh, you know, made everything very smooth and easy. And, you know, now we're uh, starting next week. We're on to the next chapter. Yeah, that's right. Well, good luck with that. I'm sure you're going to be fan fantastic. Well, your uh, last ride, yeah, well, your last ride, I didn't even know this was going on. And, I tell you, I, you have good ratings on turf. So I played you in, your, in, in the last race. I think he was like 60 to one. Yeah. And um, the fairgrounds announcer, he uses a lot of metaphors and stuff. He says things. So during, during the yeah. race or before, he said the, the last ride. And, you know, I, I didn't know what he meant by that, but he, he said it a couple of times. So I heard him say it. And then I think he finished fourth and you almost got into money there. Yeah. It was, it, it was, it was yeah. one of, you know, the fairgrounds, the stretch, there's always so much traffic yeah. because- the horses yeah. seem like they're four across and there's always, there's nowhere to go, but your horse was right there. Maybe if you got a little bit lucky, you could, maybe you could have gotten second or third, who knows, but, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, which I've I, definitely been second. If I uh, had a bit more on top of the lane, I kind of had to wait a second. Um, my horse is still, he still is only a second start against winners, uh, McAvoy. And um, so it, he's still learning, but um, yes, he's definitely a horse. He'll improve from that race and be very tough next out. Oh, he was. And I, you know, Fairgrounds is one of those. It's one of those tracks. You're, you're, there's some tracks you're. You have a really good chance of getting a clear trip because of the way the track is configured. Fairgrounds is not that track. You can get you can get hung wide and you can't get over. You can, it's so easy to get stuck inside two or three times, and then in, in, in the stretch you'd figure long stretch it would fa favor stretch runners. I can't tell you how many times the horse in the lead will last. Everyone behind him is playing pinball, and like the, you know, the horse will be tons the best. He can't get he can't get out. So it's one of those things. If, if you're a better and you play fairgrounds, you just got to be patient and you know hope you know hope your day will come. But anyway, I, I I thought he was it was a it was a metaphor for something. So I went on Twitter, and then I uh, it said yeah he's, you're retiring. So I sent you a friend request because I was, and I didn't follow right away. But I knew I want to interview this guy because I, I figured you have a good sto good story, and I knew you. Uh, most likely he spoke very good English unless you had, unless you had an Irish accent with the name uh, uh, Declan. But, but I, I do want to ask, what, what was the first meal you had after you retired? Uh, first meal I had after I retired, geez. Uh, I think it was, I had steak. Yeah, I had steak. <laughs> <laughs> I did, yeah. yeah. I had a, a French restaurant, a Cafe de Goss, right at, uh, outside the track. It's a favorite restaurant of uh me and my dad so uh that's where we went <laughs> how'd you feel uh eating dinner that night not knowing that you don't have to lose weight the next day knowing that um the most dangerous days were behind you w what was your mindset that day yeah obviously you know it was uh very bittersweet from the morning to the you know work that morning and then going home and you get you're about to go to the races and you know, it's your last time going to be walking in that room as a jockey. Um, you know, it's you did that as a you 
dreamed of that as a young boy, and then you did it. And you've, you're, I was fortunate enough to ride on some of the biggest stages in racing. Um, I had a lot, you know, a lot of success. Thank, you know, thankful for a lot of people that helped me get there. Um, but you know, when it gets closer and when I, you know, went to walk out, it's, you know, in your head, this is it. Um, but you know, obviously, yeah, I had a job to do. I had to give those owners, um, the trainer, Mr. Cassie, the best ride I could. Um, I, so my focus had to be, I have a job to do just like it was any other day. Um, and then after the fact, yeah, it hit me pretty hard that I knew that was my last ride. Um, people always say, oh, maybe you'll come back one day or you're so young. Uh, but for myself, I don't look at it as that way. Um, I, that was my last ride as a jockey. Um, you know, it's when I, it's like, a when people come out, I feel like when people retire and come out, you know, you better be focused on your next job. And that's what I am. I'm fully focused on my next career. Uh, my riding days, I say, are behind me. I got to do it for an extended amount of time. I had the success. Uh, but now it's time for my next chapter. And uh, hopefully now I'm trying to be the best. I can, you know, be the best bloodstock agent maybe one day at, and or trainer um, in that aspect of things. Uh, so now my attention goes to, Sheree DeVoe and her team and David and Gordo and his team um, and do the best I can. Yeah. Well, Declan, I think you, you've gotten some great experience, uh, probably some thrills of a lifetime. And I mean, you got hooked up with some of the, um, some of the, you know, most talented and um, dynamic people in the industry. So if, uh, if there's a place where you're going to be successful, uh, I think you found the right place. So I just, you know, I wish you the best of luck. I really appreciate you take a time and talk to me. I really enjoyed it. I, again, I've, I admired you from afar. I, I probably, uh, yeah, I, I've cashed some uh, uh, nice ones on you over, over the years. And, yeah, I think you do. I probably really cost you some money too. Well, that's part of it. That, and that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's the big thing about horse players. Uh, horse players have to take responsibility and they don't. Uh, um, there, there is a, I, I, you know, I, I follow a lot of these groups on Facebook and stuff and uh, yes. you know, people like to bash riders. And I, I look at it the other way around when I, when I pick a, when I, when I handicap a race, I look at riders that I feel have an advantage over, um, they have an advantage that they're good at that type of race. And also they're undervalued by the public, both. And you're, you, yep. you tend to be, you tend to be very undervalued on turf. And then I decide whether I like the horse or not. So, yep. um, so if I lose the reason why I, I bet a horse is because the jockey, that was the first reason uh, the other day, yep. Yeah, Paco had a, I love Paco Lopez, but he, he had a horrible day on Saturday. And I mean, okay. he, you know, he, he likes to take shots inside and when it works, yeah. it's beautiful, but you know, when it doesn't work, you know how it is. So yeah. uh, he had a 15 to one that, I mean, he just was full of horse and coming around the far turn, he waited. Everyone else was spreading out to go six wide. He took a shot and it opened up for him inside. So he got into the race, but deep stretch, yes. he couldn't deep stretch. He couldn't get through. And so as he's as he's crossing the line, yes. Pete Ayala says, uh, whatever the horse's name was, was, was probably the best. So but I yes. knew, I knew that the only reason why he was in the place he was in the first place was that he, he it was perfection to get to that spot. So to right. me, you're kind of be, and I love Pete Aiello, but you, you can't yeah. look at that and say you lost because you got blocked. Well, he yeah. got there because he, it was the most incredible run that he had. So as a, as a, as a handicapper, you gotta, you gotta take responsibility for that. And right. that was the reason, one of the reasons why I liked him. Everything went my way, just didn't get lucky next time yeah. you get lucky. So that's the way that you have to look at it. And I don't, I don't think enough of us do that. Yeah, you know, I think at, at first a lot of, you know, because now I can officially, you know, I can gamble if I want or do that. And sometimes, you know, like last couple of days, I, I put on a few bets horses I like. And um, I'm a big I if I do, it's Hong Kong I like. Um, I but, yeah. you know, yeah, Hong Kong racing, you know, um, obviously now that I can bet on it, but I've always, I've always loved it. Uh, they do, if you go to their HKJC's website, um, you can, the horse, everything is down to a T on the website. You can find anything about a horse, any workout videos of the horse every week, um, veterinary reports, it's all there. Uh, mm -hmm. so it makes it much easier for a handicapper to see every horse in the race and see what they're getting as in, um, 
we were uh, speaking earlier in racing, like in the U.S. side of things. And now it's getting better. Um, you know, Heist is involved now at many tracks. Uh, the transparency has to be there. Um, so when you can kind of as a handicapper and if you're putting your effort into it, um, I like to have it all on paper and what I can see. And, you know, it gives me the best chance as a gambler if I'm doing that. Um, you know, so you can a lot of, you know, there's people that don't want to take it serious and they throw out their money out there. That's great. You know, put it out there. But um, getting back to, you know, getting frustrated after your horse gets beat or saying, oh, this jockey did that and that. Um, I see where the frustration can come from. Obviously, you're putting your money out there. You're like, hopefully you're, you're expecting the best chance to win. Um, sometimes it doesn't happen. Just like in football, basketball, you have a player, you think, oh, I'll score 15 points. Um, and he has a bad night and scores eight. Yeah. Um, or people get upset in the NFL when a team takes a knee, when all they need is a field goal and they're right there, right? They say finish out the game. Um, so I think that the risk comes with the reward there. Um, you know, obviously, it's like anything. Like you said, pop that horse maybe next time you bet. He'll be 10 to 1. You don't know or, you know, if he's overlooked. Um, so I think, you know, I see both sides of it. Um, so I think it's a – but you have to know when you're a gambler that anything can happen. It's a part of it. <laughs> yeah. You got, you got part of it. You got to take responsibility. And you got you to embrace the journey and – Often the journey is is fraught with uh, roadblocks yeah. and disasters, <laughs> yes. but but it's part of the game. We play it for the highs. Uh, where there are exactly. a lot of yeah. So anyway, Dick, this has been great, man. I just I'm glad you did it. I, I just wish you the best of luck. I know you're going to do fantastic. Uh, let's keep in touch. Maybe let's let's do it. Maybe after you you're settled in your new career, let's let's do this again. Please do. I'm uh, always welcome to be on if you want me. I'm here, so I really appreciate you having me on, and I'll do it anytime. Oh, that sounds great, man. Well, look, enjoy your uh, your new your retirement and your new career. I know you're going to do great. Uh, I appreciate that very much, Julian. Thank you. Okay, buddy. Thanks, Declan.